Okay. All right. Okay, so just to uh, those of you who will be watching this later, uh, I think this is going to be posted on YouTube. This is the first time I've ever done this. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because this is a course called the Economics of Entrepreneurship that is a hybrid course. It's 50% online, 50% in-class discussion, but I've got several students that needed to take the class 100% online. So in order to make it as effective as I can for those students, I'm recording my lectures and they'll be able to view them. So, so that's what we're doing here. So this is also the beginning of the semester. We've had one class session so far, and this is the, the second day of classes, so really the second full day of classes, and we're just gonna start uh, with the discussion. Uh, now we have more people here that weren't here last time that just now got into the class, so let's go ahead and, and uh, talk about this course, okay? So on the board, I've got uh, some topics. Under the economics of entrepreneurship, from, from my perspective, um, first thing we want to do today is talk about entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship? And, and there's really a lot of uh, different definitions, different perspectives on what entrepreneurship is. So we're going to talk about that. A lot of people think of immediately owning your own business, right? So, so we want to talk about money, right? What is money? And even it turns out, regardless of whether or not you're talking about entrepreneurship in the context of owning your own business, money is still a factor, all right? And a lot of decisions are made because of money or money has some role in there, even charity, right? Even, even um, distribution of income in, in a country, money is involved there, taxes, spending, whatever it might be. What is power? Some people would say entrepreneurship is about power. Owning your own business might be about control, independence, that type of thing. Um, some people might say that, that certain initiatives at the, uh, at the level of government might be motivated by power or control. Maybe one group wants to stop another group from doing something else, or, or maybe help another group do something else, incentivize something. That's about power, right? That's influencing someone or some group or something, right? So we'll talk about power. Um, and then last, we want to talk about how government policy affects entrepreneurship, okay? And we're just going to really kind of brush the surface of that and and just kind of have a discussion about how government policy can actually affect entrepreneurship. So in order to have that discussion though, what we need to do first is talk about entrepreneurship. What do we think entrepreneurship is? All right, so I'm just going to throw this out to you all, the students. Um, when you think of entrepreneurship, what do you think of? Yeah. Um, creating something new with okay. an idea. Creating something new, starting with an idea. Okay, so right away you've got creativity, you've got innovation, right? You've got thinking, you've got an idea. All that right there, creativity, innovation, thinking. And uh, actually, those are so important. I'm gonna write those down. So we've got creativity. Innovation, thinking. Uh, actually, the title of the first set of slides for this course that'll go on Blackboard is uh, "Thinking Like an Entrepreneur." Right. So, what does that even mean? Thinking like an entrepreneur. So, we're starting to get there. All right. Who else? When you think of entrepreneur or entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial, what do you think of? Control. Control. Control your own. I'm going to control your own destiny. How come? Uh, you are able to determine, to a certain extent, the degree of your success of your business. Okay. And, and so, so you have the power or the flexibility or the independence to, if it's entrepreneurship as a business owner, to determine your own success as that business owner. Let's say, um, let's talk about an alternative. As opposed to what? Okay, work for someone else. They might have a different, um, different vision for their company. Okay. As far as and and if, they want to grow. if maybe the company has a different vision, is there a way that you could grow within that company, but then maybe another way that you couldn't? And how would that be? You might be conceptually opposed to the direction. That okay. You could not really believe in what the company is doing, what the company's vision is. If you're an employee for that company and you realize you don't believe in the vision of the company, what should you do? What, uh, what can you do? Change the vision of the 
Okay, so maybe you should think about leaving the company. That might be a decision. You might, and it, it depends how much invested you are in this company, right? Um, if it happens early on and it's really something that you really don't believe in the way this company operates or what they actually do, and it's just a job that you got, and, and now um, you think it's not really right for you, you could just leave, right? Um, if you have a lot vested in it, what could you maybe do? Uh, you could persuade them to um, kind of fit your vision and their vision. Okay. And, and how hard would that be? It could potentially be rather difficult. Okay. Unless you're in upper management, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe if you're in upper management, which which implies what about you? Uh, you've stuck with the time. Been there for probably a yeah. while. You've got some maybe you've been there for a while, or you've been somewhere for a while, yeah. most likely, right? You've got some experience. You've demonstrated some capabilities, right? And your, your voice is, is heard and respected and you, you have some authority, right? So maybe you can help shape the vision or reform it a little bit or something like that, right? That would be being entrepreneurial, right, if you did that. So, so entrepreneurship can happen within an organization too, right? Uh, when you begin early on, it's a little difficult, right? A little more difficult, you have to kind of kind of be shown your ropes and, and earn your, your stripes, so to speak, right? Um, and kind of get an idea of where, where you want to go anyway, right? So what else? What else do you think of when you think about entrepreneurship? Yeah? Do risk. Risk? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And, and talk about risk. Like if you start your own business, like your own restaurant, you don't know if it's going to work out. You could invest a lot of money in something and then it could you could just lose it all. Right, and right. Like even in a company, you could speak out about something and maybe risk your job or risk getting a certain promotion because you have a different direction. Sure. And that's an excellent point. So there is risk associated with entrepreneurship, whether it's for your own company or even inside of a company. Okay? You can... Uh, Today, something that's very popular it, as a career track is, uh, is getting your MBA, right? And a lot of jobs with an MBA might have the title project manager, okay? So you might get into a company, you're working there for a while, and you're a project manager over something. Maybe that job lasts for a year or two, and then you do that thing, and now it's, it's time to move on to something else in, in the company, and maybe you have proposed something, and you're going to be the project manager over this thing that you propose. What if it's a miserable failure, right? There's a risk that that could be the case. And first question is, are you up to that risk, right? And second is, what would you do if that was the case? You know, can you deal with that? Can you deal with failure? All right, so, so entrepreneurship, uh, certainly you have to be able to deal with failure, right? So, um, so we just put in a few other terms. We've got success, we've also, Got failure, right? Now there's a story of one entrepreneur, large business owner, business person, and um, I think he even comes out of the book. We'll probably read in his course, but uh, it says um, the person's father said, "The first thing I want you to do when you get out there on your own is basically fail miserably, right? I want you to see what it's like to try something and just not be successful at it at all, right?" What does that build in us? Uh, resilience. Resilience? Possibly. What's that? I said possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it, might, it might have some other effect. Yeah. We, we just you know, don't want to have that. Modesty. Modesty? All right. That's a good one. Uh, this same company, actually, at, their, at the corporate level, human resources, they do this team kind of interview process across the different divisions of the company. and. One thing they look for, a very strong, important characteristic of entrepreneurial talent is humility. Okay. Somebody, people have to understand, even at the level of upper management, I don't know it all, right? I don't have all the answers. Uh, there might be somebody even doing the same thing that might be better than me, or that might be able to show me something that I've never thought about, right? If you're not humble, you're likely to not develop in such a way, and, and maybe get along with other people, right? Uh, so that could also be, be something as well. All right, good point. Okay, uh, what else can you learn from failure? I'd say adaptation. Adaptation, yeah, all right. You, you saw how you failed, so you come back with like a different game plan to see how you can maybe succeed. 
Okay, excellent. So, so you can learn from failure, right? Um, all right, let's, uh, one other, I'm just gonna throw in there, um, it's an important characteristic uh, of individuals, um, and I'll just call it empathy. Empathy, what is empathy? Identify with the perspective of someone else. Okay, what does that have to do with, with what we're talking about, entrepreneurship or failure or success? Well, if you're trying to sell to them, it kind of helps to be able to identify with their needs. Ah, excellent point, okay. Empathy, help identify with their needs. Um, here's another example from a company. Uh, selling, just selling anything. And really, we're all gonna get in the game of selling something, selling our own skills, our ideas, whatever it is. Uh, but to understand what other people need, uh, one of the books we're gonna use in this course is gonna talk about um, having that customer-focused approach, right? right? Creating something for somebody else. And, and even in your own self-interest, and this goes back to Adam Smith, it's not so much for yourself, but it's really doing that thing for someone else, that someone else needs so much. If you don't understand other people, you're gonna constantly be trying to sell them things that they don't really need, right? That they don't have any interest in, and then maybe you don't understand them, right, as individuals. So empathy is an important character trait as well. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've kind of identified that, that entrepreneurship can happen outside an organization, like a corporation, but also inside an organization. So it's entrepreneurial, it's uh, creative, innovative, uh, thought-motivated, right, thinking. So success there is, it's action oriented also, right? And, and it's about problem solving. So uh, we'll go ahead and add up here action. Problem solving. I'll add humility. And at the same time, I'll add confidence. Right away, we can get into really deep discussions philosophically about um, you know, values, virtues, character traits, humility, self-confidence. You know, these things are, are almost opposed, but, but so we talked about balance, right? So an entrepreneur also have, has to have some balance, right? Okay. All right, so I think we've got a pretty good definition of what entrepreneurship is. Um, so just to make sure, Let's talk about what is entrepreneurship not. It's not like uh, answering to somebody else. Okay, maybe not answering to somebody else. So when you say answering to someone else, what, what if the customer is that someone else you have to answer the customer? What, go a little further with that. Like restrictive, it's like absolute freedom. It's not like restrictive freedom. Uh, with like decision making. Okay. Uh, like if you want to make a decision, you don't have to run it by anybody else. So okay. It's, so it's not. It's, okay. So with entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial decision making, you're saying then if it's not possible, it's because it's too restricted. There's no flexibility to be creative, think outside the box, right? So we could already start talking about systems within an organization that either encourage or discourage entrepreneurial decision making, right? And then we could jump to a higher level, a societal level, and talk about institutions in society that might encourage or discourage entrepreneurial decision making, right? So that's a good, good point, all right? So by talking about what it's not, um, and, and now let's talk about, um, no, let's, let's go on to a different topic. That's good enough. I think, I think that's a good enough coverage of, of entrepreneur, uh, what an entrepreneur is, what it means to be an entrepreneur, that type of thing. But it is good to think about the opposite sometimes, and, and that might help us reinforce, okay? So let's move on to, a really interesting topic in the world of today and forever. What is money? Our first reading in this course will be on the topic of money. It'll be about what money is, what money represents, how money affects decision making and actions, right? So uh, before we go into the reading as an assignment, what is money? Okay, a means to acquire those three things like via like, uh, 
uh, something exchange. Like it has to be able to be exchanged. It has to be tangible. Like it has to be uh, be able to be transported easily. Okay, so if we talk about the, the three uses of money from, a, from an economic textbook type definition, right? We've got those three the three uses of money, right? And what were those? Something of exchange. Tool for exchange, right? I don't. Remember, I remember what they are rather than like. What so medium of exchange, what you say? Isn't it a solid value? Or is yeah, it unit of account, measure of value, value, right? Store value, unit of account, value. right? So it's a measuring stick. So what does money help us do in society in terms of its use as a measuring stick? Say. Put a value on goods and services. Okay. okay. Purchase, er, purchasing power. Purchasing power. Yeah. Explain that. Um, just the. Uh, uh, I don't know, money kind of serves as a symbol, uh, and just certain amounts, you know, you have goods and services, I guess, by supply and demand, um, a certain price, you know, oriented with, you know, I guess the, uh, uh, I don't know really how to explain it. But. Okay, well, let's go a little further then. Let's say, uh, so you say purchasing power, yeah. okay? Um, one way we can think about that is the more money someone has, the more purchasing power, obviously, mm -hmm. they have, right, mm -hmm. uh, depending on prices. In, in, in the value of money, right? So we can also talk about the value of money. Okay, uh, let's keep on going. Does it yeah. give, every, does it give everyone the ability to exchange? Okay, so there's something that's just earlier in society, we had sort of this barter and ex exchange type system, right? And what did that require? You had to have something that somebody else wanted, yeah. or nobody would exchange money. Yeah, yeah. Money you, you had to have something that someone else wanted. We call it double coincidence of wants in, in <coughs> economic speak, right? But it's, it's simply, if someone else doesn't want that thing that you have, then the person, in order to make trade happen, but they want, they've got something that you want, they've got to at least know somebody else that has something that they want, and, and then it gets really, so in terms of efficiency of trade, does money make trade more efficient? Mm -hmm. Certainly it does, right? Okay? So, Let's talk about you talk about purchasing power. And some of the other had comments. What were some of your comments? Well, I was the same thing that he said. Okay. Yeah, yeah. kind of like that power just determines the value of everything in, pers in perspective in relation to everything else, like the value of this object in relation to, and not necessarily just objects, like a person, a country, right, a state. Sure, like we measure size. GDP in, in, in dollars, purchasing power parity, right? We, we try to make everything comparable apple to apple. Uh, and we, we measure GDP per capita, which is really a money uh, per person type figure to see you know, standard living compared to those types of things. What were you going to say? I was going to say, like, in broad terms, like money is like the motive. Okay. Like, that really, like, it's what people are going for. It's what people like make decisions because like revolve around. Okay. Basically everything. Okay, so money can be a motive, right? It can be a very powerful motivator, right? If we talk about incentives. In economics, money can be an incentive for, for a lot of things, right? The, the, the model for a business, we say businesses try to maximize profit, right? And profit is, is measured in money, right? So decisions can be based on that. Now, what about, uh, let's go to the nonprofit world. Is money not important in the nonprofit world? No. It's still important. Huh? It's still really important. Okay, it's still important in what way? Because, uh, they're trying to still benefiting, they're benefiting a group of people and they can't without the money. Right. And say you have a job with a non That's right. Putting it to use. Right. So the term nonprofit is really one, it's a legal definition and it has ramifications for tax, right? The tax law. Um, but other than that, it's saying that, that usually it represents some, some purpose that is not just to, to make money for, for it really gets things confusing. For the sake of making money. I would say that most businesses don't just make money for the sake of making money. There are lifestyle businesses that are for-profit businesses, right? They're not making money just for the sake of making money. That's one of the things that's understood, misunderstood about money, right? Well, so let's go back to that charity. In order to achieve its goals, can money help? Yeah. Certainly can help, right? There are very few charities that, that really just work from labor power alone, right? Um, you know, we could think about Habitat for Humanity, but have you ever looked at the, the financial statements of Habitat for Humanity? How much money is required to run Habitat for Humanity, for example? How about the American Cancer Society? How much money 
is required to achieve the goals of the American Cancer Society, right? And these groups even having to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Somebody's got to manage these organizations, right? They're high-paid CEOs, if you will, of, of some of these organizations, right? So money, money is this thing that is that is universal, right? It's just universal. So next question: Is money good or bad? Depends on the user. Right? Okay, it depends on the user. All right, depends on what it's used for. Okay. I think it's good because there's been no way to like, like rank things and like put value on things uh, if you didn't have money. Because I mean, what would you, what, how would you decide what something's worth without money? Okay, right. It'd be, it'd be difficult, right? Uh, number of beaver pelts you could trade for. <laughs> it'd be really <laughs> hard, right? Yeah. I was gonna say it's good because it helps distribute wealth. Okay, it helps explain that. It helps distribute wealth. Because, like you were saying before, not everybody's going to have a medium for barter, um, and money um, helps that. And if there's more, if there's more money available, then more people can can exchange things for money and create wealth. I mean, okay, let me ask you this question: What's one way that wealth is created? By um, Jobs um, by um, uh, what else? Okay, we're talking abstract. So yeah. let's get real specific and focus on. Give an example of somebody who created wealth. Um, somebody who owns a farm and sells corn. Okay, so we're going to go to agriculture, and we're going to say uh, somebody who has a, a corn and possibly soybean farm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, how did that allow them to build wealth? They provided a good that was in high demand. Okay. Oh. All right. And if they got wealthy, and let's first assume we've already gone to an industry that is heavily subsidized, right, with price supports. Um, so, we could argue that someone maybe created wealth in this generation on the back of, of government subsidy, right? Let's go away from that, go to pure just market exchange. By, by paying for their supplies at a certain price and selling their goods for a higher price in order to cover their costs and make a profit. Okay, so they're, they're profitable, all right? They have been able to generate something that is more valuable than the cost that they incur to put it all together. Is that bad? No. Okay, nothing wrong with that, right? So what is that higher price? If it was, they've got all these costs. Let's say the cost basis is a million dollars. And there's living. Okay, what, what, let's say the cost basis is a million, but the, the revenue generated was a million point two, and it was $200,000 of pure profit for that farmer for that year. The cost was determined by what the market was willing to pay. I mean, okay. They were willing to pay that much and allow him to All right. that much profit. And so let's say if we say we've got 1.2 million and we've got 1 million, let's talk about value. What's the difference in the two? Well, it's two hundred thousand dollars. What's the difference in terms of how did that two hundred thousand dollars get there at the one point two million? What does it represent in terms of value that the the one million? The one million is the cost basis of all that activity. The one point two million is after the transaction was made and this thing was sold off to others. Who? So that's his profit. So. That's the profit. But what is it? What's that? Return on investment. It's the return on investment. But why was it? How was it there? Yeah. Because not everybody can create their own corn. Okay, here we go. Not everybody can actually create their own corn. Uh, specialization. Specialization, okay. So this individual takes, what are the basic ingredients of, uh, we don't all have to be farmers to be able to understand this one. What What do you need? To Land, seed, seed, labor. Land, seed, labor, equipment, equipment water, yeah. some luck. Yeah. You know, a drought can really, really affect you negatively, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's even in industries that, that help with that, crop insurance, that type of thing, right? Um, but those things, right? And so now put yourself in the place of a, a farmer that owns this operation. What are you responsible for day in, day out? In order to guarantee yourself, and you're not going to guarantee it, but try to assure yourself of that profit at the end of the year. Maintenance. Just Maintenance? Making sure your crops are well taken care of, make sure no one steals your crops. 
okay, making sure things don't happen to the, to the fields, for example, right? Animals, yeah. insects, uh, disease, you know, all these types of things. So what else? Making sure you have labor or capital and like machines labor and capital so you said maintenance so that's making sure that the machinery and equipment that you have is good enough to do what you need to do efficiently right what is breaking down all the time you got to get the, the crop out of the field or whatever and it's always breaking down it's going to slow things up right what about the labor you got to make sure you manage the labor in like a certain way that after like you harvest that you're still going to have enough money left over to do it all over again right this season. sure sure so now we're in a society where Agriculture in the United States is a very small percentage of our, our jobs, right? Um, but those jobs provide the output in terms of uh, the product, the food product, for millions and millions and millions of people, right? So we could go back to a time where we're all growing our own corn and potatoes and, and on and on and on. Maybe we couldn't go back to that because what would that require? Let's say we're in New York City, right? And we're all going to grow our own corn and potatoes. Can we do it? Can we make it happen? Probably not. It's going to be extremely difficult, right? So, so we need these other places and other individuals that are interested in this type of thing, and they create value for others, right? And their reward is in some form related to that value that they create, right? And in a pure sense, okay? So that's money. All right. Let me just check timelines. We started in this class at, uh, what was this class in, 1205? Yeah. Yeah, 12, okay, so we did. All right, so um, money. What about, um, what are some bad things that happen because of money? I mean, a lot of people say money is the root of all evil, right? Crime, greed. Crime, greed. Um, corruption. Corruption. Money over resources. And it's the value of, you know. What's that? Land and wealth. It, 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 it can devalue very easily. It can devalue, and yeah, that's what. It, it can devalue very easily. Oh, okay, it's, okay. It's not, it's not a stable thing. Well, okay, it's all right. It's always going to be worth the same. Okay, that's for sure true, uh, particularly as long as we have inflation, right? The value of cash, you know, into the future will be, will be less now, right? So, so we have that aspect of money. What about to the extent that we know it motivates people? Um, good or bad, is it the money or is it, is it something else? It's what the money can give you or... Okay, what the money can give you. Maybe you're talking about power. Okay, power. So there may be a strong relationship wealth. between money and power, right? Um, you know, thousands of years ago, power gave you money right? Today, money can give you power, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but is it true that, that everybody who seeks money is seeking power over others? No, no, it's not. no, not really, right? But we're all seeking money to some extent. We don't all seek money to the same extent as others. Some want more of it, some want less. Before you had a comment, let me just, um, we're all different. Right, and so it's not really the money that we want in most cases. It's it's the things that we want to do, right? The things that we want to do, the things that kind of uh, make us tick. For some people, those are more money associated things. For other people, it's less money associated things, right? And it's not really um, anybody's ability or, or place to say that one's better than the other. We don't know. We're all different, right? And so, but money is there. As a matter of what were you going to say? I was just going to say, like, people are driven to have money, like, because of their needs. Like, they need to have water and food and stuff. And, like, some people commit crimes, like, steal stuff, so they can have enough food to feed their family. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, sometimes uh, there's a whole literature called the economics of crime, and it, and it talks about the, the money roots or the lack of money roots of crime from time to time, right, and place to place. So, you can have that aspect. Uh, but, but by and large, money. Money is a, a, just a necessary tool, right? Um, the degrees of it, we can sit here and debate, uh, but uh, we'll save that for another time after we've done some more reading on the subject, okay? What is power? Having 
having people look up to you? Uh, having people look up to you, okay? Who are people that let's say, yeah, people look up to them? What are upper management positions? Oh, yeah, upper management positions. Okay, so there's there's power there, right? The ability to influence others. What's that? The ability to influence others. Okay, the ability to influence power is that. The ability to like make things that you want to have them happen. Okay. Instead of being like able to sit by and let what other people want to have them happen. Okay. You get to make decisions and like make people do stuff or spend money a certain way. So. All right, that, that's an interesting point. So power can be the ability to make things happen that you want to happen, rather than just sitting back and hoping that those things happen. Right. That's also kind of a definition of entrepreneurial. Right, uh, or, or making things happen, right? You can be a self determined individual. You can, if, if you wish, well, there's actually a song that talks about this. Uh, if, you wanna, if you want things to change, start with the person in the mirror, right? I think that was Michael Jackson, actually, right? Uh, so start in the mirror. If you want the world to be a different kind of place, you're going to have to start with yourself. What does that mean? That might, that's not just saying, well, you're the reason for the, the way the world is. What does it mean to say that? Okay, your own actions, and it might be that, uh, what's an example of something we'd like to see change in the world? More philanthropy, I guess, what you have to give. Okay. okay, if you want to see more philanthropy in the world, you got to give. maybe you should start doing some more philanthropy yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then if you want to continue to do more of that, what would you have to do? You'll have, <laughs> have to get more money, right? If you decide one day you want to be a philanthropist, at some point, you're going to have to become wealthy, right? <laughs> because philanthropists are wealthy individuals first, and then it seems they give it all away. Right? Who are examples of great philanthropists? In uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Bill Gates, certainly. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. What did he do? Well, he lives real like modestly. He does live modestly. I don't know what he just did. I don't know what he plans to do with. Isn't he going to give it to the Gates Foundation? I think, yeah, he said something like that. I think that's his plan, right? So he, he will become a philanthropist, right? So um, I don't know what extent he is right now, but um, certainly Gates has already set up. What's that? I just don't know what he does with his money. He's so rich, and he's just, I've seen this, like, like they should show his house and, like, what his family does, and, like, right. he spoils his kids. I don't know, like, just has a bunch of it. Yeah, he's a little more secretive than your typical, uh, not a flashy, um, Wealthy individual, right? We don't, we don't know. Um, so, who are some others? Mother Teresa. <laughs> Mother Teresa. Okay, what did she do without her own personal money to be philanthropic or at least charitable? She was giving of her time. Of her time. She got countries to give money. She got countries, right? Uh, so, so. What did she have? To, what kind of sacrifice did she make in order to do that? She dedicated her whole life to helping people less fortunate. She did, right, right. How many examples of Mother Teresa do we know in the world? That's why she's Mother Teresa. <laughs> That's why she's Mother Teresa, right? So, so, but yet, how many examples of philanthropists can we name? If we just started here. Uh, what about Andrew Carnegie, the Carnegie Foundation? What's that? Bono to a certain degree. Bono, okay, what was Bono doing? Oh. Well, he, he does a lot of like, political stuff. And, he does? And, and, and helping, but not with just his money, but like, bringing attention to, to different causes. Sure, problems. sure. A That's lot of work in Africa, I think, too. Yes, work for Africa. A lot of different, he supports a lot of different organizations. That's right. And a lot of musicians do that, yeah. Um, I, there was a lady I used to work for as a cleaner pool, actually. Um, I think her last name was Lynn, but she used to just take American companies and um, restructure them and build them back up. And she's owned over 160 different companies. And um, I think she was actually on CNBC for being the, like one of the first woman billionaires. Really? Yeah. 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 So there are people that have made money in ways that we never even imagined, right? And there are, there are philanthropists in almost every town in America. Right. Um, for example, the building that we're sitting in. Uh, what's the name of this building? E. Craig Wall. 
E. Craig Wall, Senior College of Business, right? Who was E. Craig Wall? Um, or did he probably donate all the money to make this building? Right, right. And how did he make his money? Anybody ever? To be a lawyer. Seth? To be a lawyer. He may have had a law background. He was a, he was a landowner, right? And I think it was timber was his, was his industry. Right? In this area of the country, timber is a source of a lot of individuals. Um, well, not a lot, but some of the individuals that hold a lot of wealth. Uh, that was a source, of one particular source, right? So there are a lot of examples of philanthropy. Um, and so you know, those that, that end up uh, amassing some wealth can do things with it and, and have some power to, to change things, right? Um, so, okay, what else on, on power? Um, we, we said, uh, you know, start with yourself. Kind of got on that topic. Could you do if you, if you wanted to? Um, if you wanted to do more for society, for example, what could you do? If that was just your your goal. How would you make that happen? We were talking about like philosophy or business ethics the other day. How like there's such like a the, the gap between like executive salaries and like not not unskilled but like skilled but like the lowest skilled workers for like a a company or like it's the gap's getting bigger and bigger and it used to not be like that. So maybe uh, like lessen that gap, make like the people who are making so much money they obviously up to a certain point don't need it. So make them make a little bit like less so I don't know it's like socialist but like <laughs> Okay. So you were getting into a different wages fair for areas, people. right? Mm -hmm. Um go ahead. Um social entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurship. I think I I forget what the teacher was, but he was talking about how there's different businesses you can create that are called like, uh, like B Corps and LP3 Corps, I forget what it was, but like you can't make more than 19 times the, the lowest worker in your business and say if they're making the lowest amount you can make, minimum wage is just seven what, 750 or so, something, something like that? It's still like $320,000 a year if you were like. Right. So it seems like that would be a, a logical uh, cap to put on yourself, right? 19 times the lowest paid person in your company. Um, what, let's talk about billionaires. Um, what if you started a company? So you guys have kind of already gone to social entrepreneurship when I asked the question, if you wanted to change something in the world, you've already thought about um, these big picture type things like stopping this, uh, the, or alleviating the gap between the upper management and the skilled workers maybe, right? What about, what if change was just simply, you would like to make people smile on a regular basis, all right? What could you do if you were good at that? You could become a comedian, right? You, literally, you could become a comedian, right? Identify a need. You could do magic. You just identify a simple need <laughs> that, that you, you might have a talent for filling, right? Um, so it could be business. It doesn't have to be a nonprofit, right? It could be in the business arena, right? Um, entertainment, you know, that type of thing. And it doesn't even have to be entertainment. Um, what if you like... What if you like helping people find that place to live, that type of thing? You'd be a real estate agent, right? You know, it's all these different things. We tend to make uh, things a little bigger than they have to be, right? But uh, it's also important that all of us as individuals can, can do something on a regular basis that, that kind of makes us tick and it, it at least contributes to share in society, right? Um, it produces something for, for some people and it makes us happy, makes them happy, and it, you aggregate it up, it kind of makes the world go around, right? Um, it, it gets really difficult when we start saying that such and such individuals shouldn't make more money than these individuals, because we really don't know the stories behind how they made that money, right? We, we assume a lot when we say that that much money is too much money. We also assume a lot when we say that person doesn't need that money, and we should make them give it back, right? We really have to get much more into the, the kind of complexity of things and, and 
the, the deals that they've made and all these types of things before we can actually make that distinction. Um, let's talk about Bill Gates. We know he made a lot of money. Steve Jobs, we know he made a lot of money. How many other people made a lot of money because of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates? A lot. It was a whole lot. Um, huh? Wozniak, even though he was there in the beginning. Oh, Wozniak, yeah, even, right, Wozniak, right, right, so we could say Wozniak and Steve Jobs, as a result of those two individuals, mm -hmm. how many people made a lot of money with Apple? Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, right. just through the use of their products. It's like hundreds of millions. Yeah, that's a good point. Even, not just because they made money from Apple directly, but the use of Apple products, the technology that Apple created, uh, and go to Bill Gates, the PC. How many people's jobs have become more productive because of the PC, right? That's a great point, yeah. And I think of all the applications that they've created, they, re, they redesigned the way people listen to music, buy music, um, and what else? I mean, like, they've, they've done a lot of things. That, the advertisements that are on applications. Are yeah. Really even the school. Mm -hmm. Even the school. Even, even right now, I'm recording this lecture on a Mac Computer. Two students yeah. probably couldn't have. How we communicate. These two students would have missed this whole entire thing. Three students, however many it was. They would have missed the whole entire There'd been no way, right, to do this. I could have done it with a, an old, uh, you know, what's it called, the, the eight millimeter or whatever, and then how would I have gotten to them, right? I would have had to mail it to them, or who knows? It would have, it was a different world just 20 years ago, right? Uh, just five years ago, just even last year. So, uh, you know, the apps that I'm using to do this, it just came about within the last couple of years. And so, just the productivity that it created. Somebody did a, uh, uh, we're done in 10 minutes, I think. Um, showed a little uh, example of the things that just using Apple products, and say iTunes, right? What would you have had to have had 20 years ago to get that same listening experience? Yeah. Huh? A lot of, I don't even know. <laughs> you don't even know, right? I mean, it's, uh, with, with iTunes, we, we could just have something little in our pocket that has now, we could say, well, the Walkman was pretty small, that cassette tape. How many songs were on that cassette tape? 20, maybe? 12, right? How many could be on our <coughs> i? We don't even need an iPod anymore, just our iPhone. How many songs could be on that thing? Um, really unlimited, you can use. It's unlimited. We get so many that we can't even, you know, we wouldn't use them all, right? Um, oh, even with the cloud, you got like. Then you got the cloud, you, got, you can connect it to the whole entire world and all these songs, right? You could do that. Um, and, and then at the same time, what, what else can you do with it that has nothing to do with music? What else can you do with this device, this, this phone? Play games, internet. Well, you can play games. You can do everything, right? You might as well just say you can do everything. <laughs> I know so many stories of things that people have done that have solved problems just with this phone, right? Not using it as a phone. A phone has become the least uh, important part of the device almost, you could say, right? Um, and even the phone has changed. We text people. We don't even need to waste time. So time is a precious resource, right? We've enabled ourselves through using the technology that somebody else created to do so many other things, right? Make us more productive. And that's making us all wealthier. That is giving us all a higher standard of living, right? And that's not all just from one person or two people or three people, not just Wozniak, Jobs, and Gates. All these other people have figured out all these different things that are you know, utilized on this system or whatever you want to call it um, that they didn't know. About, right? They didn't know. I mean, how many people have written apps that have just done so many different things? It's just unbelievable, right? And that helps us be more productive as individuals in so many different ways. We can't even, it helps different people in different ways be productive. It helps fulfill our, our wants and desires in ways that then allow us to do these other things that are more productive. And all these different things that just 20 years ago we never would have envisioned, right? Just absolutely never would have had any idea that we could do these types of things. So then what does it allow us to do? Focus on other things, right? Devote resources to other things. You know, what does that iPod cost that has the capability to do all those things? Where if you go back years ago, you had the, let's just say, cassette player, what did it cost? The cassette tapes, what did they cost? On and on and on and on, right? And then you just start adding things up and it's a lot more money for 
the thing that we have today, which costs a fraction of that, and can do probably 100,000 times more of the things. And so that's resources freed up then to do other things, such as philanthropy or, or whatever it might be, right? It's, it's, it's almost endless, you know, not one person could ever. And that's kind of um, a great thing about entrepreneurship, right? We have talked so much about this, we've got five minutes. How does government policy affect entrepreneurship? Okay, well, we've kind of gotten toward it because one of you mentioned, what if we just said the gap between uh, executives and skilled labor is, is too great, we should cap that somehow, restrict it. If we did that, what might that do? Where does money come from? Where does that gap come from? How are these individuals making these massive quantities of money if we assume a pure market environment? No subsidies. If we just assume, what is it? I mean, how did Apple amass so much stockholder value? Innovation. Innovation? Yeah. I mean, like, if you cap the, the salaries, I mean, you might have an innovation drain to other countries. So okay, you could. I mean, you know, one could say Steve Jobs and Wozniak did what they did because they just loved doing that, and then the money came second. But what if? Other things, deals, how complicated is it to get? Well, let's talk about iTunes. They approached Sony to do this because they owned a lot of the rights to these songs. And I forget how the story goes, you can read Steve Jobs' book. But it was a nightmare process to try to get the authorization to even get iTunes to actually exist, right? It wasn't just an idea. There's copyright law, right? There's all kinds, and there's Millions of people, artists, all kinds of things. This thing was not easily solved. And so money was certainly uh, a necessary tool to help make this thing actually take place, right? So it really gets difficult. And, and so, so public policy, it can certainly be an incentive, but it can also be a constraint. Let's just, what's an example of a constraint that public policy might kind of restrain that type of innovation? Anywhere in the world. Higher taxes on capital gains, maybe. Or right, higher taxes on capital gains, we could just, we'd have to look into that. Let's really understand. We'll have to. Like, like, we haven't been involved in Cuba, like we can't travel. Yeah, an embargo against Cuba, okay. So there's an example. That, that certainly discourages some opportunities there, right? Laws, the things being legal or not. Like people are making a lot of money off of marijuana products and stuff like that, but it's technically still not legal federally. Right. And even though that some states have made it legal within that state. The I mean, decision to make marijuana legal alcohol. Right, J just that, that public policy decision right there, the fact is, in the majority of the states today, it's illegal, right? Some have made it legal. But the fact that it's not legal in the majority of places puts some sort of constraint on that. Now, we get into issues beyond just just economics, we get into ethical, we get into religious, we get into all different types of things, right? Uh, so it's very difficult. So public policy is, is not a simple uh, subject area, but we can see how it affects things, right? It certainly does affect the way business is going to take place, right? A simple example could be a lot of places, you can't open a certain type of business right beside a church or within so many, right? That's gonna affect the lay of the land, the, the way activity is, is uh, built up, that type of thing. And it's just examples on and on and on and on from that. Okay, um, I think we'll stop there for today. Good discussion.